I read um, sometimes stories about Zen masters, I'm now reading about Hakuin, where he writes about um, um, dealing with the Kongans, where the Mu, Ko the Mu Koan, and he's with it for years upon years, and he can't answer it, and it's impossible, and about so many Koans he writes that. And I just kind of was wondering, because as in he writes and others write how impossible it is to answer them, and yet over here, the Mu Koan, Jirachir and the Stick Koan, all those, we, we answer them relatively easy. As in, you know, it, like as in, even beginners kind of are able to answer it after a few weeks of practice. And kind of like I was trying to understand what, what is Hakuin, like what answers he looking for that took him years upon years as to oppose what we do here that it seems to be relatively short a time. Well, Hakuin Zenji didn't have the mouse kongan. That takes years for many of our students. He didn't have three men walking. That can take also years if you are really into it. So the difficulty is elsewhere. First of all, in Japan, uh, the samurai culture totally permeated Zen practice, especially with the Rinzai school. And that was at the very core of their mentality to fight and to die and then to be reborn in the Buddha realm, okay? So their practice as monks reflected that. You have to die on the cushion. You have to sit like a Buddha, okay? Even this question, what is the Buddha nature of this Zen stick in Japan has a different answer than during the first interview that you have here. You cannot touch the Zen stick of a Japanese Zen master. You, you get thrown out. Okay? That's where it begins. And there is a correct answer, which is not an object just like this answer. It's a subject just like this answer. I leave it to you to find out. Okay? And if you want to bring that to me in the interview room, you can do that. I practiced with Japanese Zen master and from my earlier uh, records and studies, he sort of confirmed that their way is their way. I could hold his Zen stick because uh, Harada Roshi was teaching in the West extensively, so he is not that kind of really rigorous Japanese general type of samurai. It cut your head, you know? But what you need to understand that they get these answers just as easy as we do, but the teacher doesn't approve for years, years, to make your center stronger. You already know that it's correct, but still the teacher doesn't approve. So their view of the Kongan comes from a later dynasty, not from the Tang dynasty, but from the Sung dynasty. It's in fact hundreds of years older than the Korean. If you go to, let's say, Kyoto and Mount Hiei, and you take the cable car up there, it's a fantastic ride. It's a small cable car, starts at both ends, and as one goes down, the other cabin comes up, and in the middle, there is a little lens type of, you know, double trail. And those rails are bringing the cabin so close, until the last moment you believe you're gonna crash with the other one. And, you, and they just bypass each other, hello, and one goes up, the other goes down. And you reach up there and you see, and I mean Japan, Kyoto, the powerhouse, the elite of Zen, okay? Temples with pink walls. Not kidding. Why? Because they are from the Sung Dynasty, which is the super heavy Namu Amitabu or Amida Butsu practice, which is the pure land. And the pure land is always towards the setting sun. And the light of the setting sun is reflected on the temple walls. That's why they are painted pink, pinkish. I mean, not as pink as in a kind of modern department store or some teenage clothing, but pinkish. And it just blew my mind, you know, how, that, how did this happen? So with Kongan practice, they also got a different generation. Some Japanese practitioners would uh, have a hard time acknowledging that first and foremost, they got the teaching through Korea. Then directly they went back to Japan and brought it again and again and again for generations. 
And Kongan practice, the way they do it, is a later reflection of the Tang Dynasty which preceded the Song. Korean Zen practice is from the time when the sixth patriarch was active. And that's why uh, Rinzai and Soto, or Imje and Jo Dong in Korean, they're not separate. So in Korea, the mind does not separate, let's say, gradual and sudden enlightenment. The view is hundreds of years younger. So the Kongan practice reflects that. And uh, giving Zen practitioners a hard time, well, it really begins with uh, standing in the temple gate for three days before you are actually admitted. A good friend of mine, Anton Schultz, who is now uh, living in Korea with his Korean wife and has a beautiful kid, Gino, good family. He, before he got married, spent a lot of time in Japan in a place called Antaiji. And Antaiji was the old style Zen temple where they were self sufficient, literally self sufficient. The only donation they expected was rice. That's it. And they produced everything else. And it's in the north. Not in Hokkaido, a little south, but very, very harsh climate. So Anton said that their day was 14 hours long every single day. 14 hours. Get up in the morning, practice, breakfast, work. Pretty much the same style of... Uh, daily schedule, but the content was so intense, very intense. They had no Kongan practice. It was a Soto temple. They have the Book of Serenity, and they do not have this lively Dharma combat like the Rinzai. And uh, he said in the winter, they scraped the snow off the garden so that they could get some vegetables out of the frozen ground. I kid you not, this was their life. Now, if you are romantic about Zen, this sounds superb. But if you live like that, it changes you. It changes your view. When you live like that for like the three, four long months of winter. Well, you can talk about many kinds of enlightenment, but this was one of them. So. This temple gave you the old school, very difficult Kongan practice, very difficult life, uh, so that your ego would be smashed to pieces. You would always be submitted to your own situation, your compulsory relationship within the Sangha, within the hierarchy. And Tony was there for a year, German, the Teutonic warrior. Then he came to our Shinwon Sakyolche in the 90s. That's where we met and we kept our friendship ever since. But that didn't help him with Kongan practice. That was the point. So he had this immense German-Japanese experience of tough Zen. Did it help him with Joju's Mu or the Mouse Kongan or Namchon's Cat or Doksan carrying his balls? No, it didn't. He didn't have more advantage because of this rough and tough lifestyle. So what you need is really one mind, non-dualistic mind. There's no way around it. And you can put many kinds of culture around it, but if you don't get it, you don't have it. One thing is clear. Easy come, easy go. If you get it too easily, you also lose it very easily. But making it very difficult doesn't guarantee you anything. So that's why we say, Wake up and help all beings. Because this help all beings makes you keep it. You don't do this for yourself. So, if you want Japanese Taizen in Europe or maybe even in Israel, uh, and definitely in America, you have tons of uh, Zen centers where you can try that. How it is in Japan, I don't know. I've seen temples from the outside almost as tourists. I've seen many, but we were never invited in, uh, although they understood our clothing. Uh, it's Korean monks, you know, attire. I never practiced with them in Japan. So this is uh, the cultural difference. And as much as they can be interesting, 
uh, these are not so important. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Um, what can I say to my sister when she tells me that I'm going to hell for bowing to the Buddha and chanting? You can say thank you. Thank you very much for pointing the right way. And when you have proceeded on the right way, you can come back for her to save her from hell. Mm -hmm. If she talks hell, she is in hell. Thank you. 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 I want to keep on uh, intensively practice. Uh, what do you recommend? Rest. Some practitioners are on fire after the intensive week. That's good. But you don't, no longer have the common schedule. You no longer have the Sangha's joint effort behind it. So we rested today after 5 a.m. And tomorrow morning we'll have a, a light practice. And tomorrow afternoon, also, people will have the option to take a walk. Sometimes fatigue comes the next day. If you want to keep up intensive practice, don't think in terms of the intensive week schedule. Do not. Because you'll run out of juice. We had a Zen teacher in my former school. He was an American uh, Zen master who was raised in the Japanese tradition, but the moment he met Sung San Sanim, he, I wouldn't say shifted, but he opened his mind to Sung San Sanim's teaching, but in his heart and mind, he still had the Japanese mind as an American. And uh, he came to lead a Kyolche for the international community in uh, Shinwon, South Korea. And, uh, it was his first and last 90-day retreat in Korea. And of course, we have the intensive week, just like here, tremendous stories. I mean, people had such a hard time staying awake. And results were good. Interviews were great, especially immediately after the intensive, when it's so clean inside that your interviews are sparking and you're flying like a goose in the night sky. <laughs> oh, someone got it. And the teacher said, let's make another intensive week. And he put it for the last week of culture. Yeah, everybody got sick, literally, even he did. Can you imagine that the plane is landing and it's been landing for the previous two, three weeks, and suddenly you go full throttle back to 37,000 feet, and you want to show yourself again to the bright sun. Now that's crazy. And the energy of the coach it just got totally torn to pieces. And that's why everybody got sick or tired or uh, some, some kind of uh, haziness in the mind. It was terrible. So intensive week has its one week and see you next year, okay? So it's enough. If you wanna keep up more intensive practice because you have more time, fantastic, but don't think in terms of our extended practice schedule like last seven days. Keep up the extra bows, the extra chanting, some extra sitting, but have enough sleep, important, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. So I also want to thank you for your teaching. You're welcome. Um, and I want to ask about some inner struggle I had in the Kyolche. I feel that when I started the Kyolche, I felt completely identif identified with my thinking. And I, you said in the Kyolche, keep correct situation, correct relationship, and correct function. Yeah. And my mind always want to go to thinking like white noise try to pull me and I try to say after a couple of weeks I see it's not working and I try to do what you said and not following my mind and I start started to feel 
not much, but more clarity and more um, connected. And but no, but but <laughs> I didn't completely let go of of identification with thinking. It feels to me like um, if I let go, it's not responsible thing. And you know, is this your thinking, or somebody else is thinking that you carry? My thinking. Are you sure? So I suggest an exercise. When you look at your own thinking patterns, please look inside and ask, where does this come from? And maybe if it's something too stern or strict, it's your father. Maybe if it's something very worried or very emotional, it's your mother. And inside, you have to give these patterns back to them because you were born to that family as your personal karma brought you to your parents. But you are not the machine, the product of your family karma. So thank your father for his thinking patterns and return it to him. Thank your mother for her emotional patterns and return them to her then you don't check yourself so much. Because it's remarkably clear that if you check yourself, control yourself all the time, you don't own your thinking. Your thinking owns you. Mm -hmm. And that means you did not develop that yourself. Mm -hmm. Someone else did and you take it as your own. So I suggest you return those thoughts to their origin, which are not yours. Do not identify with them. And then, if you developed your own thoughts, you can use them. And uh, they will not use you. Okay? Yeah, thank you. And You're welcome. Is it normal that I feel that only one culture will not be enough for the whole process? No. You're not the only one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, so hard. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, um, I heard you speak a few times about reincarnation, so especially lately about your decision to get married. Um, yeah, it's good advertisement. Yeah. Um, and my question is kind of how you speak of reincarnation, like it's this very clear, obvious, like physics law. You throw an apple in the air and it falls. And my question is how are you so sure that re this reincarnation is, you know, really is and it works so kind of simply as you present it? Have you had Why would I not be sure? Hmm? Why would I not be certain? Um, in theory, because uh, even from a Zen perspective, I would say, if you've never experienced it, how do you know? If you experience it, then how would you not know? Have you experienced it? Have you not? Not that I'm aware of. So more practice is necessary. <laughs> Next what? question. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask why it's important to know the origin of, of my thoughts. Is it not enough just to... No, because they come back. But you can use this moment of clarity, of non-identification, to actually see their origin. You know how many times I recognized my own mother's emotions in me, my own father's thoughts in me. We all have that. And you should be very careful how much you identify with that. Why? You cannot fulfill your parents' dreams. You cannot be the child they want you to be. You have your own path, and we thank our parents and family for helping us, bringing us you know, to adulthood. And well, that's where it ends. We are grateful. We help, we return the favor when we can. But you cannot live someone else's dream. So if you take someone else's thoughts as your own, you are mistaken. That's why in Korea they say, do not blow another person's horn. Do not flex another person's bow. Thank you. You're welcome. So if I have a thought that 
fuels my ego and my separateness, I can ask, where does it come from? Yes, you may. And it's, is it enough if I go back to my chanting and my center, or do I need to find the, the deep root of it? Both lead to extinction. Extinction means stopping the identification. If you ask the question, what is this? Where does this come from? Then you actually perceive the root of it. And when you don't attach to the root, you do not have any dualistic relationship to the root, the origin, then it unwinds itself automatically. Why? Our soul always wants happiness, liberation, fulfillment, contentment, safety. As long as we carry ignorant thoughts, dualistic emotions as our own, we are not happy, we are not content, we are not taking any refuge in the one. So if we do not see the relativity of our karma, we cannot control it. If you just chant, it means you put it into the fire and you burn it. Then you don't see its very origin. You do not cognitively detach from it. You do not just return to dawn. No, you just keep chanting the great Dharani and boom, it burns everything. Mm. So how do you want to weed your garden? Do you want to weed it piece by piece, uprooting it when the soil is wet and soft enough? It's good. It's good work. Or you have a tornado with rain and wind, and it just uproots everything and tears it out of the ground. Your choice. Either way it works. Mm. And um, Afik's question about the thoughts of being from your parents, from your mother or your father, if you imagine a practice of cutting cords with your parents, like if I see, I visualize that I'm connected to my mother and then I cut that cord, um, is that an effective practice? I didn't mean that. Mm. Don't cut the cord. You will always be connected. But choose the content of that connection very carefully. So I tried to cut the connection to my father for years. I didn't acknowledge him. And I found out later, many years later, that in its suppressed way, his norms, his maxims still controlled me. When I acknowledged him, in fact, I found a way to be proud of him. Then I could thank him, then I could let go of all those negative patterns for which I wanted to avoid him mm. and not follow him. And in that sense, the connection will always be there. But choose the content very carefully because that defines your identification. So my mother is this person for me because I got this from her. Now you can change that. Your mother's image, what you carry from her in your heart, the most important message or gift she ever gave you, you can change that. Your view can change. But the fact that she is your mother, that never changes. These cords can be thick or thin, long or short, but the connection will always be there because you ended up in her womb for nine months before you were born. That's an unmitigable and unalterable fact. Mm. And once we honor that, once we pay our respects to that, we become free from the ballast, from the unwanted luggage. And that's the only way. I found it to be very, very true. And... Um, Mostly, if we change ourselves, we change our self-image as well. And consequently, our relationship to our parents and overall family changes radically. So the change you achieve within brings about a change without, not the other way around. Mm. So if you just change the environment and you don't change yourself, your relationship patterns and the burdens within, they remain the same. Okay? Happy practice. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. 
Um, just before intensive week, I had this very vivid um, experience. And I couldn't keep it. It felt, at first it was very vivid. I, I can't put it into words. But then fear came and it just vanished. So, what, what can I do about it? This vivid experience, if I understood you correctly, appeared and disappeared, right? Yeah. I mean, I suddenly was there and I was there like maybe a minute and then I felt fear, like I had no control and, and it went away. So, I mean... Okay, yeah. it's clear what you said. Okay. If it went away after it appeared, then this is not what we are interested in. Your true nature doesn't come, doesn't go. Doesn't appear, does not disappear. So these vivid experiences, they are like clickbaits on the internet. Or very, very sweet smell before a pastry shop. Don't attach to that. Experiences are not good, not bad. They are different only in one way. Do they open the gate or not? So if any kind of experience opens the gate, you can see the realm behind it which you haven't seen before. Now, keeping the gate open is a very different effort from the first opening. Okay? So don't attach to the vivid experience itself. Keep the mind's clear space. Keep the mind's mirror-like clarity. That's all there is to it. Some experiences help at the beginning. Some do not. That's why we don't take alcoholic drinks. We don't cloud the mind. We don't go into activities that puts us into a heavier realm. Okay? Because we want to be clear. And after a while, any kind of experience helps you keep that clarity if you are strong enough, if you are clear enough, and you do not fool yourself. And sometimes people overestimate themselves. I don't talk about you now. I'm talking about those people who feel really strong and really clear, and they believe that they can not only survive a very intense experience of sensory attachment, but it will even help them get enlightenment. Sometimes they are tragically wrong. So keeping the mind clear and sensitive and stable and strong, that's our objective. That's why we say strong center, clear mind. And after a while, without any external effort, every and each experience will help you achieve and keep that. Okay? But what was vivid for a minute and it disappeared, and that was a kiss from heavens and that's it, it's gone. But we are going long-term relationship, not just one kiss, okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Something that's been uh, interesting to me to see during this Kyocha, especially as opposed to last time I was here, four years ago, um, is the amount of couples um, over here in the Kyocha. Um, I don't recall that last time there were so many people in relationships that came here, even part-time or full-time. Even you're in a relationship here and <laughs> never thought that would happen. Um, and uh, <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'll admit, you know, sitting here and sometimes I see couples, they come together, and kind of my first automatic reaction is like, you know, kind of like, the practice is, it's my practice, you know, every individual has to work on themselves and, you know, this other person is just sometimes bothersome or, you know, it takes away your mind or something like that. Um, and I would say, as a Kyoja keeps on going on, I actually just kind of calm down a little bit, uh, especially during the, the New Year's Kido, somebody was sitting and they were doing the chanting and then I saw someone and his girlfriend who were holding hands while chanting. And I actually found that to be like a very beautiful thing. Um, and so kind of my question, if you can, I don't know, especially now, you can have like some thoughts or ideas on kind of um, the practices and an individual practice where I do my own work, where the place of another person is or can be within your practice. Well, 
it's a huge difference. First of all, when you are without a significant other, i.e. you are not in a committed relationship, you don't have the couple karma manifesting, still, you practice not for yourself, but you are directly interfacing and integrating into the group. So the individual and the group are together without the couple or the family phase. All right? It seems easier, but many times it's not complete because you leave your couple karma and family karma behind. It's uncultivated. So when you have all the four integrated, we have integrated three already, and starting August or end of July, we integrate all the four. Now, that will be an interesting ride, okay? So when that happens, I don't know how many heads I will have. <laughs> but when you practice with uh, your beloved, either hand in hand during chanting or just uh, sharing life, sharing time, sharing everything, it changes your perspective 180 degrees. I can tell you that. The difference is beyond the description. None of them are better than the other. But you should know when to do each. You have to stick to your path. And if your path is going unmarried for some time and going direct between the individual and the group, do that. If you feel that you follow the rabbinical tradition of getting married after a certain age and producing three, five, six kids and then be seven, uh, <laughs> nine, <laughs> okay, uh, you have an agenda, I can see that. <laughs> so uh, do what you feel is most important. That sets up your timeline, that sets up your priorities. And uh, I think what's most important that you don't break your own heart and you don't break anyone else's heart. If you do the wrong thing and you don't believe in it, you've broken your own heart. Illusions are not a problem. The lack of reality, that's the problem. If you don't set up your priorities, you live someone else's life. You have to know what's most important and who is most important. Okay. So I think uh, if you're honest with yourself, you really take care of karma that was left behind, that is uncultivated, and that's your blind spot. No religion, no form, no book can give you an appropriate guide to that. You have to see it for yourself. And sometimes you have to go beyond the official and established boundaries and change yourself in order to cultivate something that you used to leave behind, used to consciously and willfully ignore. How do you notice that you have ignored something? It always comes back as a ghost, as something haunting you, something in the dark, as a secret, something unresolved, unpleasant, hindrance, a problem, something you are ashamed of, something you carry with a heavy heart. That's your untreated karma, something you haven't taken into your own hand. You haven't seen it because you refuse to look at it. And I believe all of us have debts in one of the four departments, maybe more, individual, couple, family, and group karma. I think in the West, we have the greatest debt with the group Couple and family, everybody wants that, and at a certain quality, at a certain level, we cultivate that. But the group suffers, especially in Eastern Europe. I, I call that the deficit of loyalty. Groups change. Individuals don't have trust in larger groups, or there has to be an interest-based relationship based on rewards and fears so that people would integrate into the group. In something as unconditional as Zen practice, it's very hard and very painful to see that very few people are actually truly loyal to it long term. So this shortage of long term commitment, that's group karma. People have 
good reasons not to trust big establishments. If you look at the last 100 years of European history, what did we do with the groups? How did the groups treat the individuals? What happened uh, during the social upheavals and wars and uh, revolutions and hyperinflation and shortages of food and water, any kinds of scarcity? So the individual has deep distrust in any formation where they cannot express themselves. And in the Orient, the biggest debt is with the individual. They are coming into their own in the last couple of decades, what it means to be creative, individually responsible, not just be part of a family or a larger group, but actually looking at themselves, who am I? Believe it or not, in Asia, especially in the Confucianist hemisphere, like China, Korea, Japan, until recently, their individuality was not important. It came as a distant second to their role in their family and in their society. So if you asked a Korean like 20 years ago, what's your job? They say, I, I work for Hyundai. They didn't say I'm an engineer or a painter or a marketing specialist. Now they say that first and then they add the large company that they work for because their individuality was not important. Their role, their function, their relationship, that was important. So let's do the homework, whatever that is, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. So I really want to thank you all for practicing together, doing this culture in this wonderful, harmonious together action. And let's rewind the tape. Have completely beginner's mind. Sometimes in these board games, you put this little figure of yourself back to square one. That's what I need you to do right now. Do not discard the last 49 days. Just make a strong reset in your mind that this is the first day of culture. And do it with a complete beginner's mind. And then you don't have any leftover thinking from the past, whether it's recent or more distant past. Once we can do that, we understand how human mind, time, space, and karma work. So let's do this together, just like we have done so far. Thank you for our conjoined effort. Let's do this. Let's continue. Thank you.